So I'm Scott Kelly from the Division of Mission Ministry, and this is our third uh, partnership with the Visiting Artist Series. So it's a great privilege to be here tonight with our panelists. Uh, Laura Fallsgraf is uh, the director of the film, 39th. So she's a director of engagement at uh, the Chicago production company called The Kindling Group. Um, she leads strategy and impact for feature films and digital campaigns. So after writing for uh, after writing video and digital content for President Obama's re-election campaign, she joined the Kindling Group as a producer. So welcome, Laura. Uh, Representative Will Gazzardi, the subject of the film, um, is from the 39th District, which includes parts of Logan Square, Avondale, Hermosa, Belmont, Cragen, and Portage Park. Uh, he's been in the legislature since uh, since January of 2015, and at age 30, he's one of the youngest members in the Illinois House. So welcome. Thank you. Uh, Flonia Hoxha is a programs assistant at Run, Run for Something. She's also a third-year student studying political science at DePaul, uh, born and raised in the Chicagoland area. Uh, Flonia has interned and organized for various local, national, and uh, a number of issue campaigns. So welcome. Thank you. So I'd like to focus, there's a lot of different directions we could go uh, with the film. Obviously, um, we have all have different uh, opinions when it comes to politics. What I'm interested in is the category of participation. How do we get people to participate as a core commitment of not only democracy, but also of social justice? It seems that participation is one of those key categories. I thought we'd start with the film, Laura. Uh, what brought you to this film? How do you decide to do a film about a candidate running for office? Um, so I actually I used to live in the 39th district um, and I happened to know uh, Will's campaign manager from my previous work in politics. Um, and I actually want to uh, just shout out uh, the film's DP and producer, Adam, and our editor, Josh, who are also here tonight. Um, so I think they both also lived in the district as well at the time, um, or just outside of it. And we were all really jazzed because we had heard about this candidate who was um, taking on someone who had been running unopposed for many years. Um, and our neighborhood was just kind of abuzz with, um, with excitement um, about Will's campaign. So uh, as a filmmaker, I just was like, I can just walk down the street and kind of capture this excitement with my camera. Um, and so if, also if you saw any like bad shots in the film, they were mine. Um, <laughs> don't judge me, I'm not a DP. Um, so, uh, so it was just like a really pretty grassroots um, uh, production as far as coming out and just like watching the campaign unfold. Um, and really from our standpoint as the film um, kind of uh, took on its own life, I think we really saw the opportunity to um, tell the story of the power of getting involved in a local campaign. Um, I hadn't really paid attention to who my state rep was before, and um, just seeing the, the potential impact that that role can have on your day-to-day -day life, um, as well as just like what happens when um, all your neighbors come together um, to volunteer and knock doors and get to know each other. Um, it was just like a really kind of exciting um, moment to be a part of, so yeah. So when, when you identify the, this an interesting subject, interesting topic, you don't know the outcome. How do you, what's it like making a film where the outcome is uncertain? It might not be a happy ending. I mean, how do you handle that? Yeah, well, I don't know how much the film gets into this, but this was actually Will's second campaign mm -hmm. that we filmed, um, and he lost the first time, but by yes. very little. It, it was the first campaign that you filmed, but it was our second campaign. Yes, yes right. <laughs> uh, yes, I lost the first time around, uh, yeah, by a very narrow margin. Um, and so that was also why like, the neighborhood was really excited, because he'd been involved in the neighborhood for a couple years at that point um, when we started filming. Um, and honestly, like from a narrative standpoint, maybe it would have been like easier to tell the story, like a dramatic story, you know, if it hadn't turned out well. Um, but from like uh, from a standpoint of telling like a hopeful story about um, what kind of impact you can have when you go out and volunteer, I think it was really powerful to to see that pay off. Mm -hmm. So, well, I'm sure you get this question a lot when people think encouraging uh, participation, particularly of young people, to run for something. How do you handle that question about life experience and you know 
in some people's minds, they think of representatives at this level of responsibility that you need to have, you know, a couple decades of of professional experience before you do that. How do you address that concern? Um, it's funny. It's a question that when I was running anyway, I almost exclusively heard from like the political class, pr pr political professionals, you know, campaign people or strategists or, you know, uh, people from uh, political organizations. Uh, they would say, well, you know, isn't he too young? Aren't you too young? What's, what is your experience? When you talk to voters, when you go door to door talking to people, um, first of all, people rarely ask, but when they did, I was always nervous. I'd be like, yeah, I'm 26 years old. And they would say, ah, it's so great. We need some new blood in there. Uh, and I think what you're seeing in politics at every level right now, from our mayoral elections to the presidential elections, is that people are very eager to elect folks who aren't sort of laden with the baggage of political experience, right? Who are. Um, we're bringing fresh perspectives to politics. I think that the uh, sort of entrenched political systems are pretty visibly broken at this point. And so I think it's really an advantage to young candidates um, that if you can, you know, if you present yourself uh, in the right way and you're able to reach out to those voters and have those kinds of interactions with them, they're excited to support someone who is so visibly like not part of the old school. Mm -hmm. So is this uh, a, a psychological barrier for you, deciding that, yeah, I'm, I'm going to do this, I'm going to run? It was my age? Yeah. Yeah. Um, to a certain extent, yes, but um, I think I had some idea when I was first running of the level of commitment that it was going to be to run for office. You know, I, I quit my job. Both times I ran, I quit my job and I ran full time. And as I said in the movie, it was 12 hour days, seven days a week for six or eight months. and um, and. I knew that there were not a lot of times in my life when I was going to be able to make those kinds of commitments. You know, that yeah. when I was 40, I might have a family and not be able to quit a job and spend 12 hours a day, seven days a week doing this. Not that people with families don't run for office or shouldn't, but um, but that as a you know 20-something young person, uh, it was a sort of it was a, a moment in my life where I could throw myself fully into this wild adventure, uh, and so it felt right. It felt like the right time to do it. Yeah. And it, it was so insightful in, in the film. Um, I love that scene where you're, you're working out in your room because <laughs> you got to squeeze that in at some point, right? Yeah. I'm not um, sure I love that scene. <laughs> <laughs> um, I remember working on a campaign myself way back when, and we ate so much Burger King. I mean, that was uh, just... Yeah. <laughs> It was, was just like part of the. Training. There were that's right. Yeah. There were two places right near that office on Fullerton Avenue. There was uh, uh, Papa Ray's where they had the jumbo slice uh -huh. for five dollars. It was like a slice of pizza that was this big, and that would sustain me. And then the Chinese place, Blue Willow, down the street had like a lunch special that was five dollars also, and it was just this enormous. So yeah, I mean, like I said, I quit my job. I was twenty, yeah. so I had like a lifetime of savings to fall back on. Uh -huh. I was dead broke and hungry all the time because I was walking. So I was like, yeah, I was. Not optimal for my health. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, do you get to the point where like I just need a vacation from this thing? I, I need a few days off. Yeah, yeah, and you don't get it. Uh -huh. um, I mean, that's the thing. So the first time I ran, I lost by 100 votes. Right, we got 125 votes. In fact, on election day in the film, you can see me with a pin that says 125 on it, and it was what we reminded all our volunteers on election day. We said, listen, you know, two years ago, this election came down to 100 votes, and uh, you know. What the difference between busting your butt today and sort of taking taking it easy and slacking off and sitting in the Dunkin' Donuts for a while could be the difference between me being a state rep and me uh -huh. going home. And it was that sort of mindset that motivated me during this campaign when things were ugly, when the weather was terrible, when the, the politics was really messy. It was just thinking that like, yeah, sure, I could take some time off. I could take two days off, and that's you know, 50 voters I won't talk to, mm -hmm. and that I know personally from past experience that that could be the difference. So uh, it makes you push yourself that much mm -hmm. harder. And I can say I <laughs> followed him for one canvas, I think, only in the snow. And we we cut out after like two hours and I was so cold and so miserable at the end of it. And it was just like amazing to me that he was doing that. He had been doing it for months and continued doing it for months after that. That was every an day. eight hour canvassing day. <laughs> yeah. And they were like, oh, two hours, I'm done. <laughs> you learn how to bundle. You it do was it. the first polar vortex that, that oh, year, wow. I think. Yeah. It was, it was. So. There were two days where we did not go out on doors and just did phone calls all night instead uh, because it was, yeah, negative 50. <laughs> 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 I just, yeah, it's, 
<laughs> I, I don't envy those folks who are going through the polar vortex and you know whatever is a month ago or so uh, out here in the municipal yeah. elections. You know, it's, there's always people working hard. Yeah. It's tough work in yes. Chicago when you got the yes polar well, elections in winter in <laughs> Chicago. Right, yeah. great choice. Uh, Filoni, what what brings you to politics? I mean, why? Uh, how have you landed at, at this? Is something that's interesting to think about and be involved in. Yeah, so I, my sort of existence is political. My parents are refugees, and I was an anchor baby. And so by that fact, we have always sort of been entrenched in politics. Our livelihood was at stake various times throughout my life, so I always had to be actively paying attention to what was going on in politics. So getting involved at an early age, whether it be knocking on doors for a state rep or an alderman a candidate, it was always something that I was particularly interested in doing. Um, it got only got ramped up as I got older and I got involved in the 2016 election and then eventually found my way to run for something. Mm -hmm. So what, what's it like to be involved but also to study it as an academic discipline? Oh, it's so different. <laughs> I mean, uh, we at DePaul have quite a curriculum that really encourages um, the outside discipline of politics. They encourage us to go get internships. That's a requirement of our degree. So uh, that is the work that we do here. But um, learning something in theory is uh, quite different from actually going out and doing it. Mm -hmm. And I've always found that I really like actually being at the doors, um, actually being, um, actually doing the work every day. Um, as much as I like reading, um, <laughs> I feel like I can make the biggest impact while actually yeah. working in politics. Yeah. Um, another thing that struck me in your, your background with Run for Something, which is uh, it's, a, it's a virtual uh, yeah. platform of engagement. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about engagement, going door to door is one very real and important thing that, that we'll get to in a minute. But then there's this whole digital space. Yeah. And are, what's it like being in, involved in the, the digital space? So the digital space allows me and quite a few of our team members the flexibility to do outside work like knocking on doors. So I was involved in the municipal elections this past uh, cycle in Chicago, and that allowed me the ability to go you know, spend time with various campaigns. It allows people like our comms uh, secretary, Leslie Lopez, who is um, actively uh, a person in the Maryland um, state legislature, as well as our comms secretary. Or um, our, one of our regional directors is going to grad school. So it, it gives us that sort of flexibility, which is awesome. It also, we build community within our team and a culture within our team, and that is the same culture that we build with our volunteers. We have about 8,000 active volunteers that run for something, and we try to plug those volunteers that we've made an, an online community with in actual campaigns in their areas. We encourage them to recruit people in their areas. We encourage them to go knock doors. Uh, we really pride ourselves as being interested in voter contact um, and grassroots organizing as a method, but we are an online platform. So we sort of have to um, look at things in a bigger picture, but also get very local with our specific volunteers. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a broad question open to anyone. Um, when I reflect on the engagement that happens in the digital space, um, it feels pretty depressing and hopeless and divisive. How do, what, what is it that gives you a sense of hope that people can come together and work through difficult, complex problems and actually find solutions? Um, hmm. I, can, I can take yeah, it. Go, if, yeah. go ahead. I have some yeah. ideas, too. But, yeah. yeah, so one of my favorite places on the internet is uh, a Facebook group that we have for some of our endorsed candidates. Um, it's a Parents Who Run Facebook page. And it is the most wholesome place in the world. Um, there's moms talking about um, what kind of sunblock they use when they go out in Canvas to make sure that they don't get sunburned. Or there's parents who said that their kids ripped up all of their lit that they leave at the doors. You know, there's various things. So it's a very wholesome place. It's a very um, people after you know 10 hours of knocking on doors come home. You know, sometimes disappointed that only five people answered the door. Sometimes with amazing stories that are so hopeful for the other candidates, and it um, it allows a place for both like solace and camaraderie for all of our candidates and building that community and having um, you know people rooting for you 
online is, you know, just so helpful and um, a great place for our candidates to be, and I think one of the best places on the internet. Yeah, I mean, I think that's just it, right? There's, um, I don't think the internet is inherently more or less toxic than uh, other forms of community, right? Uh, I think if, if anything, we're peeling back and discovering more and more how toxic the sort of traditional forms of community can be in many instances, right? Um, but uh, I, it, while it may seem like sort of divisiveness and anger are the like overriding tones of the internet, um, I think it also has the potential to be uh, this tool for for bringing people into communities they never thought that they could find, right? I mean, I think that uh, people who are who feel isolated politically or socially or emotionally have found tremendous like support and connection through uh, digital engagement. And and in campaigns, you know, we um, we value. Uh, online engagement in a real way, um, but particularly when it does exactly what you were describing, when it brings people from the online connection into human interaction, right? When you can get, we can use the internet as a tool to bring people together in the real world, that's when it can be really powerful. That when we can, you know, create buzz online that leads to you coming into the office and then volunteering and going and meeting your neighbors and doing that, uh, that's when you see the internet at its best, I think. I am a member of some uh, parent Facebook groups, now. <laughs> and um, and I do think that like uh, like online to offline piece is just like so critical. Um, like I'm a member of a Logan Square parents group, and people are posting things there about like going out and volunteering for various um, issues or for candidates. Um, but they're also posting things like, "Hey, um, like, does anyone have extra formula for my baby?" Or like, "Who who can recommend babysitters?" And you know, it's just like people who I, you know, don't necessarily like stop and talk to um, at the coffee shop, but like they're all helping each other in this in this community. And I think. Um, I think what I really liked about filming Will's campaign was also that, you know, 50, 60, I don't know what like a max number of volunteers you had on a, on a given weekend was. Yeah, in there probably. But like tons of people showing up to this tiny, I mean, it wasn't a tiny office, but um, to this office for this local race um, and just getting to know other people um, in a new way in your community was really special. So there's a point in the film, Will, where um, you're talking about a paper that you wrote in college, and I keep thinking, as a university, Flonia, write papers. Um, how, not necessarily from a political perspective, how you handled this challenge, but what do you think about your past self and where you are today in terms of your development and, and thinking of complex issues, and do you look back on your college self and go, ah, that guy was, you know? Or do you say no? There, there's something that was here. I mean, how do you how do you think of that? It's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, I, you know, I came of age at the very beginnings of social media, right? Like when I got accepted into college, um, I was so excited to get my admissions packet because it had you could create your college email address and then you could sign on to Facebook because Facebook only allowed if you had a .edu email only from certain universities at the time. So like the coolest part about getting into college was being able to make a Facebook. Um, uh, and I remember how scandalized I was when they added photos to Facebook. I was like, wow, you're ruining the whole thing. This is, what is this, MySpace? Um, so, that's a joke that is going over the heads of most of the audience. It's okay. Google it sometime or whatever you guys yeah. do now. Um, make the like dad jokes. I'm like, I'm too old for the internet. Um, I guess so. so but, uh, you know, one thing, the reason I'm saying all this is that you all, the generation who's in college now in particular, um, everything that you say, everything you post, is there forever now in a way that like that is very foreign and new. Um, and, you know, 16 year olds and 19 year olds are not always thinking about maybe in 10 years I'll run for elected office. I wonder if this uh, is going to be something I'll be proud to have said <laughs> on the internet. Um, but that's real and it's, I think it's a, uh, an unfortunate aspect of the way the internet works right now. And I, um, 
I am. Uh, it's distressing in some ways. Um, you know, for me, this was a this was an op-ed I wrote for the school newspaper. Um, the truth about I me mean, to answer your question, the truth about that piece is that the the degree of nuance that I expressed in the op-ed that I wrote when I was nineteen was like so vastly higher than the degree of nuance I could express as a political candidate seven years later, uh, or that is really available to me in political discourse a lot of the time now. Um, uh, like the issue of uh, registration of sex offenders is a really complicated one. Um, and there are ways in which uh, it functions very poorly and really harms the lives of people who are trying to rehabilitate themselves, right? Um, and as you saw in the film, I was maybe trying to like find a way to have that level of nuance when I'm on the phone, right? I'm like figuring out how to wordsmith my response to all this. Um, and the trouble is that campaign environments are just not places for nuance. Um, uh, voters have very little information and they're gonna retain very little information. Um, and you have to just be very clear and straightforward and direct. And if you seem like you are wavering or you have a couple of different things to say about an issue, it can get bad fast. Yeah. Um, and I've, I find in the policy making space, there's more room for that now. Like I feel like as an elected official, I can take on these more nuanced issues in a different way. But certainly on the campaign, um, yeah, there's, there's not a lot of room for gray. Mm -hmm. So as you think about yourself as a college student writing uh, things and putting it out there, mm -hmm. um, how do you think about uh, you know your positions and how you know what you put out there and how you engage with people is you know this is almost like it's set in stone that's going to be there. It is really tough. The mm -hmm. The call-in, call-out culture that exists today, with you know whatever has happened on the internet previously, is very difficult. But I don't think that should stop us from expressing our opinions, being vocal about matters that matter to us. And um, I think we always have the chance and the ability to evolve. Um, I, the things that I believe now that I'm very vocally opinionated about might not be what I believe in the future, but I don't think that should discourage me or you know, past Will or anybody else that is a student or any writer um, from really taking a very nuanced and uh, opinionated view on certain issues. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, it would be a disservice to us all if we didn't have opinions just for the fact that maybe one day it would be brought up again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when I was in college, this was before all of this stuff. So it's almost like for a certain generation, you get a hall pass, you know, for papers that you write. I mean, there's a record. I think that I wrote them. I graduated, you know, <laughs> but um, there's not uh, it's not out there for public display. And I, and I have, you know, papers that I wrote and I go back and, you know, I'm glad that it's not out there as a digital footprint, but it always reminds me that, you know, uh, developing a voice and a point of view that's out there in the digital space, it's, um, you know, to be mindful of it. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me connected in some way to the whole Ralph Northam stuff, right? I mean, that like, uh, um, how much are we willing to allow people to write off as a youthful indiscretion or like a silly mistake I made when I was young? And how much, what crosses the line into like, this is inexcusable for behavior for someone at any age mm -hmm. uh, and something you need to be held accountable for, right? And um, I think his behavior, in my view, is obviously on well, well on the other side of that line. Um, but I think that's a question, especially as people's records become permanent in this way on the internet, sort of like this archival uh, history of your thoughts and opinions and statements and pictures and everything else. Like that question of what are we gonna be able to simply chalk up to I was a young person figuring things out, and what is going to be, uh, you know, what's going to be something that you have to carry with you and speak to for the rest of your life, right? I think for some of the film students in the room, like this, also comes back around to um, to the work that you do too, um, because you could have easily said like. I, I don't want you to like be in my business during this campaign or like look, you know, 20 years down the road and, and think that, you know, having a filmmaker around was going to like reveal something untoward or that you, you know, would grow out of. Um, and I, I think I think, though, that like candidates who um, can kind of commit themselves to like a level of transparency and like authenticity have less to worry about when that's, you know, when that's. Um, uh, an opportunity, um, and I think that was partly, you know, what made the film successful was um, 
Will's like ability to just like roll with it and be transparent when we were around. Yeah. And it was, it, I just really enjoyed that it was a, it was a window into a campaign and, you know, and politics and, and um, seeking election that um, you, you wouldn't know otherwise. You don't know what it's like. And so to have that window that's very authentic. And I appreciated, you know, your, your candidate. I mean, this is, this is real time. I mean, these are, these are real conversations and they're not uh, manufactured and polished. And I'm sure they didn't look terribly <laughs> manufactured and polished. Um, can, can I just add one more thing on this? Because sure. um, uh, I think it's important to, I mean, we talked about this, the, the narrative, the story, the fact that it was a happy ending, right? Um, I think that what's one of the really important pieces of stories of the film is that um, on the one hand, it's very honest about like the realities of politics that they're not always pretty and that it, get, it gets ugly and it takes a toll on you as a candidate and it's hard and it's messy uh, and it's cold and whatever. Um, but I think the thing that's, I think in, in my view, the most important thing about the, the, the film is that um, it's a reminder that that stuff can be overcome. That like, when you talked about engagement at the very beginning and getting involved, right? That um, we don't want to give anybody the illusion that it's just this glamorous, wonderful, easy life on campaigns, which it's obviously not, but that the hard stuff and the entrenched politics and the negative attitudes and the old school ways of doing business and the guys in the trench coats, like all that stuff really can be beat if people are willing to roll up their sleeves and get engaged and fight through the hard stuff and hold true to their values even when it's difficult, right? Like that, that we can win and that we can uh, genuinely reshape the way that, that politics is structured. And, and that thing I say at the end where I say like the, all the other folks in Springfield are gonna look over their shoulders uh, and worry about seeing another grassroots candidate come, that has in some ways really happened in the last four years, that there have been a bunch of other incumbents who've gotten beaten by progressive grassroots challengers. And um, I, you know that, that's one of the legacies of that campaign that I'm the proudest of, that I think we have uh, put a scare into folks about like what kind of government they need to be participating in and how they need to be legislating. So I think uh, it's an important lesson that, like, yes, this stuff is ugly. Yes, people can are gonna dig up things from your past and try to slander you and use them against you and all that stuff. And good campaigns rooted in values, rooted in community, can overcome that stuff and win. And that people must feel the importance of getting engaged because it's the only way to beat that stuff. If we don't get engaged, that stuff just keeps winning. Mm -hmm. And when we do get engaged and we do fight and work together, we can beat it and do things differently. Mm -hmm. So as a filmmaker, Laura, how did you know the direction that this would take? Not knowing the outcome, but how did you know what kind of story it was that you wanted to tell. Did you, did you have this idea before you went into this or did you go in and say, you know, wow, it's really a story about this when I had thought it was about that? I think from the get-go, really, um, the behind the scenes piece I, I thought was important. Um, you know, giving people more of a, a look at what the work looks like to run a campaign. Um, and I, I feel like it's worth mentioning, it's come up in a couple of conversations at screenings, like um, getting involved in politics isn't just like being the candidate or volunteering, right? Like there's so many interesting jobs that need filling, um, that need more diversity in the field. So, um, so we wanted to show like, not just like what it takes for a candidate to, to run, but like all of the amazing people that like go into that process. Um, so, I mean, that was definitely a story that as it unfolded and we were filming like a couple times a week, um, we felt like um, could be really strong. Um, and then the, the story of political participation um, was always kind of front of mind um, because, you know, it wasn't about, wasn't necessarily about platforms or parties. These are two candidates who are part of the same party running against each other. Um, and so, uh, so telling the story of, of that community piece um, always seemed like organic to the project. Mm -hmm. So, well, you, you run a campaign, the first one wasn't successful, you run another one, you get elected, and then you get to Springfield. Yeah. What's the difference between running a campaign and doing the job of being a representative? Oh, they're totally different. <laughs> 
totally different. Um, and it's, uh, I have found in my shortish time in politics that there are some people who are really good at one or not the other, right? There are some people who are really good um, legislators who lose their seats because they're bad at campaigning, and some people who are really vibrant, exciting campaigners who just cannot legislate. Um, because the way you have to operate as a candidate um, is, uh, requires creating like bright lines of distinction between yourself and somebody else, right? And really elucidating the ways in which you're different um, and drawing clear contrast in the minds of voters. And then you get to uh, legislating and you have to deal with gray and nuance again. You know, before I said, you know, campaigning doesn't have, doesn't, don't have a lot of room for nuance. Government is all about that, and it's all about, um, you know, I think the sort of perpetual challenge that I face in government is this struggle between um, when to uh, hold fast to the vision of the perfect and when to make the compromise for the good, right? When to not let the, the great be the enemy of the good, or whatever the saying is. Uh, anyhow, that channel, that tension is like active every day in my legislating. And there are some times where like there's a compromise on the table and a deal within reach, and you have to say it's not good enough. We want better. And there's sometimes when people are yelling at you, we need better, we need better, and you have to say, look, the only way we're going to get anything here is by settling for good and not great. Um, and that's not a tension you experience at all as a candidate. As a candidate, you say. Perfect. I'm going to deliver everything 100% perfect and great, and it's all going to be wonderful. And you can be your most aspirational self and really like speak to the highest virtues and values that you believe in. And then you deal with the realities of governing, uh, and you have to still hold true to those virtues and values, and also try to navigate through through the sort of murky waters of uh, the entrenched political system that you're a part of now. Uh, yeah, very very different. Should we make a follow up? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I think it would Drama. be uh, yes, a different story. <laughs> I I was um, I haven't seen the film in a while and um, was just reflecting at, at, towards the end about how the the ending um, was relevant for several years because um, we had this budget crisis for two years and um, and you know things weren't moving um, and so I don't know I'd be curious to hear like. Like if you were to rewrite the ending with today's perspective, like how have things changed yeah. over your time? So. Yeah, I mean it's you know that frustration that I expressed. That was six months into my term of office, and it was right after you know I had gotten elected and Bruce Rauner got elected at the same time as Republican governor. So we had a Republican governor and Democratic legislature, and four years of total gridlock. Really, state government was totally gridlocked, um, and we now have elected a Democratic governor and a Democratic majorities in the legislature. And which just started in January, and the experience, uh, and it was a nonpartisan setting, but just the lived experience of being in Springfield, of government, of everybody pulling together versus like this total broken, locked up system, uh, it's totally different. And the ability to get things done and to feel like you're accomplishing things in that setting. Uh, it's like a very, very different feel. But yeah, those four years, you could have asked me any time in those four years, and I've been sitting there and I was like, it's very frustrating. It's really hard. The governor and the speaker, and they're fighting. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> so, um, Flonian, in your experience, do you have, uh, when you think either university experience or in, you know, in uh, political engagement, you know, out in the real world, whatever that yeah. means, um, do you find that um, do you find it difficult to engage across political difference? You know, where where people come from a very different starting point, mm -hmm. and you're talking about complex issues. Do you find opportunities to bridge? Yeah. So mm -hmm. at Run for Something, we have a certain set of ideals that we use when we mm -hmm. endorse candidates, but one of them is meeting people where they are. Right. Everybody's on this political journey, and some people are very you know well-versed, some are not, some are different areas, different aisles, and so we have to meet communities specifically and people, even more specifically, where they are and try to figure out how we can best represent them and best represent their interests and find out what is um, what problems they're having and how their representative can be um, somebody that can have solutions for them. So 
oftentimes um, local politics is the place where you can fix most of your issues. And that is a way that you can bridge a sort of divide in your politics, right? You like your local representative, whether they are a Democrat or a Republican, because they're getting things done for you. Right? It's a, sort of a nonpartisan way of liking whoever your representative is. Because um, at the end of the day, you want your trash off your, you know, yeah. off your curb, and they're going to do that for you. Um, so it's a, it's a way to, to really appreciate who's representing you. And if you don't like them, you run, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Um, so I don't find it terribly difficult in local politics, obviously. When we look a little bit um, in a larger scale, we see a lot of differences yeah. in uh, national politics. Yeah. I want to talk, we've got a few minutes before I, um, we can take some questions from the audience. Um, but I want to talk something about, in the, in the green room, we talked about the, um, the whole door knocking experience. And my perception was, oh, that looks awful. <laughs> I mean, it's not that I don't like people. I'm not like a terrible person. But it just seems like you know, going door to door, and you, you have no idea what people are going to say. And, but, but you found that that was really Engage it. Yeah, I loved it. it was, uh -huh. I said to you, it was my favorite part of campaigning for yeah. sure. Um, and that's partly because as a candidate, if you're doing things right anyway, you're mostly spending your time doing two things. One is door knocking and one is making fundraising calls. <laughs> so just by comparison of the two things I was doing every day, door knocking was much more fun. Um, but uh, yeah, I, there's, there you have these really magical moments when you're knocking on doors and talking to people, um, especially as the candidate, but I think even as vol volunteers or canvassers working on issue campaigns or whatever, um, and it doesn't happen all the time. A lot of the time, you know, 90% of the time, like I said, there's nobody home. And then when you do find somebody, uh, a lot of the times the interaction is very sort of superficial. But enough times you talk to somebody who really has a story to share with you and, um, is just has just been you feel like they were sitting in their home waiting for someone to come along and say I want to represent your needs what are they mm -hmm. right and and they want to share them with you and tell you their story and the struggle their family is facing and how they feel like government has let them down and who's been on their side and who's been against them and what they wish government would do for them um, and you get to have this moment of, with folks where you hear this and you say, well, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm trying to go out here and represent folks like you and make sure the government reflects your needs and not the needs of the powerful and the entrenched and the wealthy and the connected. Um, and you can have this, you can forge this sort of bond with people even over a brief period of time. And then when you run for office twice and then you serve as the legislator and you end up going door to door a lot and going to community meetings and block parties and this and that, and you see these folks time and time and time again, you really, uh, at its best, you get to have this experience where people were cynical and skeptical and frustrated and you showed up and they gave you a chance and they showed out and voted for you in an election where not a lot of people showed out and voted at all, and you won, and then they feel like the person who's representing them is really doing what they wanted, and that it's just like uh, this magical, kinetic moment of democracy uh, that happened on someone's doorstep, uh, and it just reminds you why you do it and keeps you motivated to keep going. I love it. I don't know what to tell you. I'm, yeah. I'm a dork for it. <laughs> so if there are any questions uh, from audience members, I think we have um, some microphones over in the corner. Uh, can we bring the microphones to the people? Or should the people go to the microphones? Um, explain the second part of your question a little more. Oh, sorry. I just meant, do you think that um, uh, you would still make the film, the film, the director? Do I think Laura would still make the film? Because uh, Laura I thinks she would still make the film. Laura. <laughs> it's uh, fine. Laura, sorry. And then do you, uh, do you think you would still make the film, and do you think that you would still run today, and mm. still end, would win? I'll let you go first, since there wouldn't be a film unless you decided. <laughs> yeah, I think I would still run. And frankly, um, I 
I think I would win. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, not because I think that I'm so great, but because I think the politics of this moment um, are uh, a lot of the stuff that we, I mean, you heard during the campaign me giving the speech about like uh, right. entrenched political power and corporate power, mm -hmm. uh, you know, controlling interests within the Democratic Party mm -hmm. and us needing to be a party that represents the interests of the many and not the few. And like that language and rhetoric, I think, is really. Uh, Mm -hmm. has, has grown much more since four years ago when I was talking about that stuff. So I think that uh, I want to believe anyway that right. I would be able in this moment to tap into an even greater well of that uh, sort of energy and enthusiasm. Uh, and I think people felt it and believed it then, but I think have been really activated in, in that way of thinking and that interest in politics more so since that time. Cool. Yeah, I mean, um, as far as making the film again, um, I think it's a really interesting story. And I think uh, there are actually, like Will said, like a lot of stories like that unfolding all over the country right now. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting because 2013 feels like 100 years ago at this <laughs> point. Um, and, but I think the, the message and the story are still very relevant. Uh, and. I'm, I'm hopeful that we can continue screening the film in ways like this and, um, and continue encouraging other people to run or work on campaigns and, or just go out and vote. Um, so I think I would make it again, yeah. yeah. Cool, thank you. Hi everyone. Um, push that up, there we go. Uh, so I just had a question. Uh, you were talking a lot about um, organizing your campaign as like a community, um, having like a tight knit team, um, and you work um, with Run for Something, so you're working with a lot of different um, uh, campaigns and stuff like that. And so I guess when you're trying to unify a team to deliver a single message around a candidate, um, I'm sure it's difficult when you have some people that are acting as like outliers and kind of uh, disagree with you on some things, or would you, um, so I guess what, what is your approach to, to dealing with those people who still support you, but maybe uh, may give a different answer if it's just one-on-one -on -one with a different person? That's an interesting question. Um, I'll give my thoughts on it, feel free to chime in here. Uh, but I, you know, we, um, we were very diligent about training. Um, because, yes, people came to my campaign for a lot of different reasons. Um, they didn't like the incumbent, personally. Uh, they didn't like political dynasties. Or uh, there was an issue on which they, the incumbent had voted the wrong way. Uh, or they were part of a political organization that supported me. Or they really liked my stand on Thing X. Or they thought it was gross that they were getting all these mailers about Will Gazzardi being a pedophile. And they thought whoever was doing that must have been wrong. So let me go help that guy. Um, and. One thing that's really sort of extremely important in political campaigns is repeating the same message and theme to your voters over and over and over again. Because people are going to hear a lot during campaigns. They're going to get a lot of messages about a lot of different things. And when they go into the voting booth, they're going to have a very short snippet in their head about this election, especially for like state legislature, right? They're not going to have a well of knowledge about both of the candidates. They're going to think, oh, Will is the candidate who's this, and Tony's the candidate who's that, and that's as far as it's going to go. So every t we really believed, and I still believe this about campaigns, every time you communicate with voters, they have to be hearing the same theme over and over again. It doesn't mean the same exact material but it means the central theme that defines the difference between one candidate and the other has to be the through line in all that communication. And so before anyone would go out knocking on doors in our campaign, they would spend an hour in our office like learning how we like to talk about the issues and going through sample you know, demonstration door to door uh, and uh, making sure that they were communicating the theme that we were trying to communicate over and over. So that was, uh, the training was a big part of that for us. Yeah, so for, in our experience, since we're working with so many campaigns, um, we endorsed 700 candidates in the last two years. We've elected over 200 candidates, so it's, it, it's a, you know, at scale. Um, we offer our candidates a variety of resources with a variety of political partners from, you know, um, all over the country. And they, uh, our political partners, as well as like the resources we offer on our website, um, have trainings for campaigns. How do you train your volunteers before you go out on a canvas? How do you, um, 
how do you make a platform? How do you write policy? How do you message things for your constituents and your, your campaign staffers? Um, so we offer all of those things to all of our candidates. Um, and we also make sure that when a candidate is you know, uh, planning on you know, working with volunteers, that they have all of the mentorship that they need to, to get to the point where they feel comfortable talking to their campaign staffers and having this uh, specific message. Um, so we have uh, about 500, a network of 500 mentors that will get on the phone with any of our candidates and describe to them how it, what it's like to you know, uh, get every single volunteer on the same message. So ours is just a little bit more at scale, but same sort of general principle. Very interesting. Thank you both. Thank you. So thank thank you all. I, I have to say I'm I'm encouraged. Um, I'm not discouraged at all, and that's been like a really great feeling, both from the film and the conversation after. Um, and there's a sanity to what you're saying about how to run a campaign, and politics in general, which I really really appreciate. So two questions: one, how is that scalable? It sounds like grassroots really helps in terms of keeping um, that sense of community, that sense of conversation, um, that sanity to a campaign. And by that, I just mean that rhetoric doesn't spin too far out of control. Maybe there's issues that go negative, but there's there's this connection with people that you still have. So how do you how does that stay scalable as we get into these larger and larger? Um, offices, you know, what are some of the things that you've been talking about? How do you see them working as you move up into those um, bigger elections, right? Because I would love to hear mm -hmm. some of the way that you're talking about organizing a campaign and running a campaign, seeing that in these larger scale races. Yeah. Um, and two, I'm curious about money. You mentioned fundraising, but how does money play into um, even the smaller races, and yeah. how do you manage that? Yeah. Um, I'm going to answer the second question, but I'm actually going to defer to Laura for the first one as someone who worked on a presidential campaign that I think actually had a lot of these values built into it. Um, so I'll, I'll give you some time to. Yeah, and I'm not sure Flonia has. Force you to answer this question. You probably have some experience with that scaling piece too. Yeah, sure. Um, I think uh, I I really came at um, this grassroots campaign from the like highest, not the highest level, but a totally like. 20,000 foot view where I was writing emails and video scripts and um, in an office for you know 20 hours a day um, <laughs> tapping on my computer um, communicating with voters and so I was seeing I was seeing this at scale every day in 2012 um, and that was great and felt really impactful and um, was involving a lot of fundraising that was most of what I was doing by the end. And so you kind of see like um, how the the mothership <laughs> um, operates, but it was all in service of that grassroots work. Um, and like one of the some of the most memorable moments that I had from the campaign um, were going out to the field offices where um, I was like actually like writing the email communications for it. I wrote emails for the state of Ohio, for instance. So I went to Ohio's. <laughs> Hey, um, <laughs> I went to Ohio's, uh, one of Ohio's field offices and got to actually like, meet the volunteers and, um, and get to know the people whose voices I was writing in and that was really meaningful and, and um, grounded all of the work we were doing in, here in Chicago um, in what the whole point was, right? All the money was going to um, the doors and the lit and the, the um, turn out the vote operation. And probably some political ads too. But <laughs> I don't know anything about that. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I mean, we could talk a little bit about the scale, but one thing I think is very interesting is the money section mm -hmm. that you were talking about. Um, for our candidates, um, this story is very um, similar. Most of our candidates are running in sort of a David and Goliath race, where they're challenging an incumbent, whether it's in the same party or um, in the general election, and they are making quite less money, right? Um, we recently had our first winner of the year, and she made 18,000, or she raised $18,000 to uh, her challengers, $150,000. And she ended up winning, 
by quite a bit of a margin because she cared about the issues specifically in Oklahoma City, uh, one of them being transit and bikes mm -hmm. and making sure there were bike lanes. And she cared about mental health issues. And so she won in her area because she had all of these grounded issues in her community. She wanted to solve a problem unlike you know, her incumbent. So um, I thought the money thing was a really important piece because then that scales with all of our other candidates as well. So all of our candidates, most of them I would say, are not making, um, the, they're not getting the same kind of money that the incumbents are, but they are making an impact and winning elections. Yeah, just to speak to that from my perspective, um, I, I really believe in the power of the grassroots and of community organizing and, and grassroots political operations. Um, I also know firsthand how important it is to raise enough money to run a good race. Mm -hmm. um, and that is very different from race to race and from, you know, depending on how many voters you're trying to reach. Uh, but um, I couldn't have spent all the time I spent on doors talking to people, meeting voters, having those sort of magical experiences with people if I had had to call all of our volunteers and remind them to show up on Saturday morning or call the printer and make sure that they've got the lit ready for us. For the, like, there is so much work that has to be done to make a campaign run um, that if you don't have a team of people doing it, you as the candidate do it, and then that takes away from your most valuable asset, which is your ability to interact with the voters directly. Um, so I think like hiring good staff is so critical to running good campaigns. I was so fortunate to have incredible staff, both times I ran actually. But in, in this film you see uh, Erica and Melissa and Rachel and Thomas, our intern, with the accent and the tie. Um, uh, but you know, these folks did incredible work and making sure that they were paid was like a critical piece of why I had to be on the phones raising money. Uh, and yes, we got outraised and outspent by a lot. Um, I think there's a point where there's diminishing returns with money, um, but it's not zero, right? Like there's a certain amount of money where it really is impactful and matters and you have to hustle and work hard to raise it. Uh, and if you don't get to that point, you will have a hard time getting off the ground. But, but then, you know, beyond that, like I said, my opponent raised, uh, you know, we, we easily twice and maybe three or four times as much as we raised and spent in that campaign. And it didn't matter because we had raised enough to run a good campaign and to build that grassroots operation and to make it a well-oiled machine. And then we just did it and we did the work and, and that was able to propel us to victory. That's probably how you spend the money too, right? Totally. Like spending the money on, I don't know, 20, 30, attack ads and that crazy like weird chiller font with the crazy <laughs> photos like you know it was scary at the time but it like when you ref when i reflect back on it i'm like that probably wasn't a recipe for success yeah, <laughs> um, yeah or or paying volunteers right like paying people to go canvas who don't really know who the candidate is and don't really care that much like mm -hmm. i think it's also like smarts and how you use the money that you raised absolutely you know? absolutely do you have time for one more? So I, th I think we're out of, are we out of time? Um, I think we're out of time, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> the whiteboard so, says wrap up. Yeah, <laughs> so I'm gonna wrap up. All right, okay, I guess up. I'm yeah, supposed yeah, yeah. to wrap up, yeah. Um, first, let me say thank you to all three of you for, for coming and uh, sharing your experience and wisdom with us. Um, as we think through what participation means in the democracy, but also as an important category of, uh, you know, these higher virtues like social justice and, you know, participation is, is just essential. I'd also like to thank uh, Wendy and Suzanne for our partnership, uh, the Division of Mission and Ministry. Um, this is a great opportunity here to, to talk about really uh, meaningful and, and engaging topics. So thank you to everyone. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thanks for having us. Mm -hmm.